everyone. Sorry, sorry, I'm starting a little late. Um, okay. Uh, before I start, are there any questions? Either what I was talking about last time, or um, about the course, or anything like that. Okay. Well, so then I'm going to start talking about the introduction. Um, and so based on the introduction, I can say more precisely now what the main question of the book is. I mean, that's what Kant discusses in the introduction, basically. So, and the main question of the book, Kant says it's going to be, how are synthetic a priori judgments possible? So, um, so this is a question about judgments. Now, uh, I introduced some examples of judgments last time, right? A judgment is at least the simplest kind of judgment, what Kant called a categorical judgment, as this form, right? It has a subject and a predicate. Um, so, uh, in these, so this is the judgment, right? For example, like uh, all of the world is yellow. Right, so S is gold and P is yellow. And these, as I was starting to say last time, are called the concepts that the judgment is made up of. Is, does, does anyone have a question about that? Because I know from experience that even like I have to introduce this distinction between judgments and concepts in almost every course, and yet I know from experience it always causes confusion. <laughs> um, I think it partly causes confusion, I think, especially because the way we use concepts now in English is tends to be looser, right? It's like, uh, you have no concept could mean something like, you don't know. <laughs> Um, so, um, so concept could be con like interchangeable with like opinion or proposition or something, but, but here we're using concept, especially for these things that you need to put together to get a judgment or a proposition. You need to say something about something, right? And the thing that you're going to talk about and the thing you're going to say about it have to be, you have to have concepts that, um, as Kant will say, like determine or refer to the object that you're talking about. Um, okay, so, um, um, and, uh, Um, right away, Kant introduces, again, what I was saying from last time, that there's two types of judgments, a posteriori, a posteriori judgments and a priori judgments. Now, I mean, when I say there's two types of judgments, it means like there's two types of grounds on which we can assert the judgment. Um, right, so in other words, we're talking about, we're, we're dividing judgments up on the assumption that you have some ground for making the judgment. <laughs> um, and the question is whether the whether the ground for making the judgments is experience or whether experience is not necessary to back up this judgment. 
That's the distinction between a priori and a posteriori judgments. So, um, right, and that's the a priori part of this question. Um, now, I mean, why are judgments so important? Well, so basically, according to Pratt, the type of intellect, or so I'm going to use the word intellect sometimes as the equivalent of what Pratt called understanding. And um, right, the term word is um, uh, understanding actually, or Verstand, both of them can be, were used as equivalents of the Latin word intellectus. Um, and although Kant usually uses the German Verstand as the noun here, when he derives an adjective from it, it often will be intellectual. Right. So, like, for example, um, an object that we know uh, using our understanding alone without using the senses, you will call it an intelligible object or a human object. The Latin word intellectus, equivalent to the Greek word use, the German Verstand. Okay, so the type of intellect or understanding that we have, Kant says, is one um, that can only know objects by way of concepts. Um, a concept is the way an intellect like ours represents an object. What is that way? Well, I'm going to talk about it in more detail in a second. But basically, we know um, our intellect knows objects by way of like universal rules that they can conform to, right? Like so, for example, gold um, is like some kind of rule for the way something could be. And if it is that way, it counts as gold. Um, that's the way our intellectual understanding knows them. Uh, uh, how does it not know things? Well, it doesn't know individual things directly. And that's what we need the senses for. Um, so, um, so a concept is the way we rep an intellect like ours represents objects, and a judgment, therefore, is the way an intellect like ours um, um, represents something as being a certain way. It takes two concepts at a minimum to do it, right? I have to, first of all, be thinking about, referring to, determining, picking out, aiming at something. That has to be by by using a concept, because that's the way our understanding represents things. But then if I want to represent that thing as a certain way, I need another concept. So that's why our judgments, uh, uh, which are these combinations of two concepts at a minimum. Again, there's more complicated ones that might have more than two. But at a minimum, there have to be two concepts. And um, those are like the fundamental unit of our knowledge. Right? Like all the things we can know are things like that a certain thing is a certain way or is not that way or something like that. Right? So all our knowledge and even our, all our possibly true or false opinions are all made up out of units like these judgments. Um, this this isn't something that only Kant thinks. I mean, this is basically Aristotelian um, logic and it's uh, empiricists and rationalists um, both agree with this, that this is the way we know things. Um, 
so, but that's why this question is about judgments. How are, how are synthetic a priori judgments possible? If they are possible, then in principle, we can like start to build up knowledge that is synthetic a priori. It will be composed of synthetic a priori judgments. If it's not possible, then um, we can't possibly know anything that's synthetic a priori. I haven't said yet what, synth what synthetic means, but I'm going to get to that soon. Other questions about this so far? Yeah. Um, what you say are all our knowledge is made of judgments. So there's no, like, just a concept by itself. Right, because just a concept by itself is just a representation of something, right? So I'm just like um, gold. That's neither true nor false. For it to be true or false, I have to think something about gold. Um, now, I mean, you might ask, what if I just think gold exists? Doesn't that just have one concept? Well, that's a that's a special kind of con of judgment that Kant is going to have something to say about later. But um, but for the most part, anyway, what you what you know about gold is going to have to involve another concept. And if you don't bring in another one, you're not going to be able to think something true or false about it. So yeah, that's a good question. Are there are there other questions about this? Because I mean, like uh, um, everything going forward in the book is going to be about judgments and concepts. <laughs> so if you're confused about it, you're you're like not going to understand what he's saying about every anything. <laughs> um, all, all right. I mean, I'll tr I'll try to. I mean, I'm going to say more right now about what concepts and judgments are. So. Um, so there's, I think there's two ways of thinking about it. There's probably more than two ways, but there's two ways that I know of thinking about it. And one is the easier way, and the other is the more accurate way, which is the way things usually go, right? You, you get what you pay for. So, um, but the easier way is easier and also is the way Kant usually talks about this. Um, and the way he usually talks about it is this that a concept is um, like a list of marks or notes or these are technical terms, you might say characteristics. So for example, the concept goal might be something like um, yellow, heavy, and soluble and upward. Right? So something will count as gold if it's yellow, heavy, and soluble in aqua regia. So um, when I represent something as gold, I'm representing it as having the characteristics on this list. And of course, other characteristics, right? There's nothing that's only yellow, heavy, and soluble in aqua regia. It's going to have other characteristics, but my concept, this is why my concept is a universal to which many different things can conform. My concept only specifies that it has to have these three characters on the list. Um, and then, if this is the way you think of concepts, then you think of judgments as um, taking two lists and saying whatever has the characters on the first list has the characters on the second list. Right? So I call this like the S list and the P list understanding what a judgment is. The judgment says, Whatever has all the characters on the S list has all the characters on the T list. So like the judgment that I had written out before that I erased, all gold is yellow. 
says whatever has these three characteristics, yellow, heavy, and soluble in aqua regia. Aqua regia is a combination of nitric and hydrochloric acid. Um, someone there they you can see a video on YouTube of someone dissolving gold in aqua regia. <laughs> so um anyway, um uh so right, so the judgment all gold is yellow says that whatever is yellow, heavy and soluble in aqua regia is yellow. Um that's obviously true. <laughs> um uh, but I mean you might have another judgment like um Suppose that the list of characteristics in the concept body, so we're going to choose the concept gold. The concept body might be something like the list is that it's extended and it's a substance, right? Extended means it takes up space. Right? Uh, so, uh, and substance means. What? That roughly speaking, that it's a thing rather than a characteristic of a thing. That it's something that can exist on its own. So uh, if this is the concept body, and then if I make the judgment all bodies are heavy, And I'm saying that whatever has these two characteristics, extended and substance, also has another one, heavy. In both these cases, I'm only putting one thing on the P list, right? I hope that's not confusing. I could say something like, um, um, all gold is corporeal, right? All gold is body. Then I would be saying whatever is yellow, heavy, and soluble in reactor with life for which has also extended in a substance. I mean, like I said, this is this this should be this sh I hope I'm not making it sound more confusing than it is. This should be a pretty simple way of understanding. Right, you, the the concept represents you know picks out a certain kind of thing by giving a list of whatever characteristics that thing has that have, and then the judgment like combines those lists, uh, claims that the same thing meet both lists or or something more complicated. But again, in the simplest example we're talking about, this is an example of what Kant called uh, an affirmative universal categorical judgment. Um, right? It, it says what something is, not what it's not. It says all of that thing is that. Um, it's the simplest kind of judgment to understand. And in this simple kind of judgment, um, if you understand consonants as the as a list of characteristics the thing has to have, then the, the judgment just says whatever has one list also has the other list. Um, and then on this way of understanding what concepts and judgments are, um, this is the explanation of the difference between synthetic and analytic judgments. In an analytic judgment, such as all gold is yellow, everything on the P list is also on the S list. And that's why, as I said, when you understand all gold is yellow, I mean, everything that's yellow, heavy, and soluble in aqua regia is yellow. It's obviously true. It's an analytic judgment. Um, and it's obviously true because, uh, again, the predicate is contained in the subject concept. That is, on this way of understanding it, it means the predicate everything in the list of characteristics that is the predicate concept is already on the list of characteristics that is the subject concept. You could say something like, it's true by definition. 
Um, I mean, that's not the way Kant is going to say it, partly because he thinks we don't really have complete definitions of empirical concepts like gold, right? This is always open as we know more about what gold is, we'll tend to in, like add more things to the concepts. So whereas someone like Locke says, that just means we're changing the meaning of gold every time we do that. Kant thinks of it as um, that we're like expanding the concept goal. Like we're learning to put more things in it. Um, so therefore, he doesn't, he wouldn't really talk about a definition here. But I mean, but you can certainly understand it that way. Um, and, you know, like that's the way Locke understands this distinction. Locke calls, and what the Kant calls analytic judgments, um, Locke calls uh, trifling, I think that's the word he uses, judgments. Right, that is because, as Kant says, they don't increase your knowledge, you already do. Uh, and right, and that, like the way uh, um, Locke would explain it is basically, yeah, the definition of the word gold is something that's yellow, heavy, and soluble in aqua regia. And so, by definition, all gold is yellow. Um, that would be an analytic judgment. What's a synthetic judgment? Well, it's a judgment where that's not true. Like this one, all bodies are heavy, according to Kant, right? Kant says uh, heaviness is not part of our concept of a body. And so when we say all bodies are heavy, we're claiming uh, that um, whatever has these characteristics, also has another one that's not on the list. And that's a synthetic judgment. A synthetic judgment is not obviously true in the way an analytic judgment is. You can't just check this list, right? You can't verify that the judgment is true just by looking at this list, because heavy is not on the list. So you're going to need some other way. You're gonna need some way to connect heaviness, which is not on this list, to all the things that have the characteristics on this list. And in the case of this judgment, all bodies are heavy. Kant says, how do you make that connection? Experience. Right, you experience that all the things that have these characteristics also have another one heavy, and that's how you learn that the judgment is useful. Um, okay, so like I said, that's the simpler but less accurate way of understanding what's going on here. Are there are there questions about this one before I introduce the more abstract, and more accurate one? Yeah. Is this speaking to the judgments? Using S yeah. Does that mean that you can have one judgment with multiple subjects and multiple predicates? Is that okay? No. So by the S list, I meant by the list of, right? Remember, I was saying that we're understanding a concept as being like a list. Yeah. Well, I thought it was like subject list. Yeah, it is subject list, but I mean, it's the list of characteristics that by which we're picking out the subject. That's, that's what I meant by S list. All right. Um, so, right, so like in this case, the S list would be yellow, heavy, and soluble and operative. And the P list would be yellow. But there's only one thing in the P list, but there could be more if the predicate concept were more complicated. Okay, so I mean, the, like, the, what's unsatisfactory about this is that it really only works when you're talking about this simple kind of judgment, like all A's are B, right? If you want to talk about a judgment like, um, if all A's are B, then all C's are D, which is what Kant calls a hypothetical judgment. Or if you want to talk about a judgment like, um, uh, some bodies are yellow. 
it's not which is a particular rather than a universal judgment um then this way of looking at things gets harder to apply that's one of the problems with it but another problem with it which i think in a way is more important is that the rule by which a concept picks out its object is not necessarily going to be a list of characteristics i think Kant knows this but i'm, I'm um, but like I said, he usually talks as if it were. So, um, let me see, what can I write this? I can't erase this for now. Um, so he usually talks as if a concept were just every concept were just a list of marks. But when we get to certain kinds of concepts, it's going to be hard to understand them that way. Um, and I think in his more careful statements, he'll just stick to saying that a concept is a rule. Right? Like I said, it's a it's a rule to which more than one thing could conform. It doesn't necessarily take the form of a list of characteristics. Right, like so. Just to take a simple example, which is going to come up again. Um, think about the concept dog. Well, you know, um, some dogs look like this, and some dogs look like this. <laughs> I guess no dogs look like either of these things. Too. <laughs> I was once trying to figure out how to quickly draw a dog and make sure make it not look like a horse. But <laughs> anyway, so right, then is um there's a lot of different ways something can look and count as a dog. There isn't um there isn't necessarily a, a list of things they all have in common because like um a dog who has a head that has a head of a certain kind. It's got to also have a body of a certain kind and legs of a certain kind. The dog that has a head of a different kind is going to have a different kind of body and different kind of legs. So it's not so much that there's one list of things they all have in common, but there is a rule that things have to follow to count as a dog, right? Like if it has this kind of head, it has to have this kind of body. If it has this kind of head, it has to have this kind of body, right? If you just stick the head of a great gain onto a chihuahua body, that you know, like that's not going to look like a dog. <laughs> um, it's it has to the parts have to fit together in a certain way to count as a dog. Um, so like that's that's a simple way of seeing that not every um, that not every rule that is a concept can necessarily be written down as a list of characteristics, right? I mean, it especially gets um, um, hard to see that when we have a concept like extended or substance or cause or whatever, right? Like, um, it's not, uh, sure it's not. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, hard to see a list of characteristics that will ensure that something counts as a cause um, or a substance or whatever. But I think it's easier to see that when you think of something as a cause, there's a certain like, um, uh, rule you have in mind that it has to conform to to count as a cause. So we look at a concept as a rule, and look at the judgment as applying a rule on a condition. So judgment says that, you know, under certain conditions, this rule will apply. And then the simplest way of specifying those conditions conditions is just by using another concept. So then we get a categorical judgment like we were talking about before, right? Where the condition is is the rule of the subject concept. 
and the rule we're applying is the rule of the predicate concept. But on the other hand, in a hypothetical judgment, right? Like if um, A is B, then C is D, we're saying that this whole rule here that C's are D's applies on the condition of this rule. So it still has the form of applying a rule on a condition, even though it uses more concepts and uses them in a different way. Um, so like, I think this is the right way to understand what Kant thinks the judgment is when we bring in all the other kinds of judgments that we can, um, that we can make. Um, and on this way of understanding what a judgment is, so right on this way of understanding the, what a judgment is, the difference between analytic and synthetic was just, are the things on the P list already on the S list? On this way of understanding what a judgment is, the difference between analytic and synthetic is, um, is the condition itself sufficient to imply that the rule applies. Right, so the judgment asserts that a certain rule applies on a certain condition. If you can um, infer from the condition that the rule implies, then the judgment is analytic. But if you can't, then you must know some other way that this rule always applies on this condition. Right, just as on this way of understanding it, um, if the thing on the P list is already on the S list, then um, that's an analytic judgment. But if it's not, you must know some other way that, right, like if I put heavy here, I'm going to have to get too. Uh, if I put it, uh, um, usable here, which means it melts. Right. If I put fusible here, uh, then uh, I'm so, from somewhere else. I must have figured out that whatever has these characteristics also has this. This, I mean, this like this way of thinking about it is a special case of this way of thinking about. It, right. This is an abstraction, which this is a special case of. Right, so here, like the condition is that it have all the characteristics on this list. And the rule is that it be fusible, that is it can melt. So it's not analytic because the condition is not, a, not sufficient by itself to imply that the rule holds. Um, but using this way of understanding it, you can apply the same synthetic analytic distinction to any judgment. Um, Kant doesn't give a lot, if any, examples of doing that. <laughs> but he does talk as if that this distinction between analytic and synthetic applies to any possible judgment. So, I mean, this is actually, I maybe should have talked about this before. Uh, um, Kant doesn't give a lot of examples. Period. That's one of the things that makes that's one of the things that makes this book so hard to understand. Right? He rarely gives examples. Um, if he does give an example, he usually gives an example of the easiest possible case, and then he says, and it, he says this so often, it's almost a running joke in the book. He'll say, and the other cases are easy to fill in. And you, you start thinking about the other cases and you realize it's not easy at all. The other cases are much harder than the one he discussed, right? Like he argued that that's in the introduction where he says, you know, he explains the analytic synthetic distinction by talking about affirmative judgments. And although he doesn't say this, they're not only affirmative, but they're simple in all these other ways. But he says, we're going to talk about affirmative judgments. Then he says, in the case of negative judgments, it's easy to fill in. But it's actually not so clear about how already, even in the case of negative judgments, like if you think of it this way, it's not so clear exactly how the distinction is supposed to apply. Um, so, uh, you know, 
Uh, apparently, you would say that this would have to have not yellow, and then it will be analytic. That is, it will be analytic that all gold is not yellow. <laughs> I'm sorry, all gold is not not yellow. <laughs> that um, but uh um but this is a weird kind of predicate, it's not going to give any examples like that. All right, so um um but so it's not that easy to fill in for the other judgments, but at least I think if you think of it this way, I mean there's other reasons to think of it this way, but but the first reason we're encountering now is that if you think of it this way, you can understand how in principle any kind of judgment could be analytic or synthetic. Um, well, and I just realized that my camera is not pointing the right way. Yeah. Now you can see all the things I wrote. Um, Oh. So that so that Okay, so um, so like, is everyone clear on what the difference between analytic and synthetic is supposed to be? Yeah, it's this is self-evident. Well, I mean, it's the reason they're self-evident, right? Kant thinks other kind of judgments are self-evident too, right? Like, for example, he like he would agree that five plus seven equals twelve is self-evident. Or um, you know the the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. You would say it's self evident, um, but they're self evident because the condition I've given in the judgment is sufficient to get the rule that I'm applying. Or again, in this simple case, you could say they're self evident because they're true by definition. And I mean, and it, it, it's important because, like, um, that it's important because the re the very reason that they're self evident is also going to be the reason that you don't learn anything new when you when you learn their truth. Whereas other things, although they're self evident, nevertheless they they contain new knowledge. Okay. Um, okay. So. So that was good. Are there are there other questions or comments about this? Or... Yeah. So synthetic statements draw on some sort of unconfirmed knowledge. That... Well, it's not. No, I mean, if it's unconfirmed, then it's not knowledge. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So so I mean, but they draw on something besides the condition of the judgment. So, it, um, as Kant says in here in the introduction, there has to be something else, X, by means of which the subject and the predicate are connected to each other. Um, um, Okay, I mean, I'm going to talk about that. I'm about to talk about that because now I'm going to go back and say how this distinction between analytic and synthetic is related to the other distinction between a posteriori, a posteriori and a priori. So, um, so
So first of all, Todd says all analytic judgments are a priori. So this box here, which would be analytic a posteriori, is empty. There are no analytic a posteriori judgments. Um, uh, in more recent times, some people have tried to argue that there are analytic a posteriori judgments. I can't say a posteriori. <laughs> anyway, uh, people have, some people have tried to argue there are such judgments. A famous person who made that it's all Christie just died last week. Um, whether they're even talking about the same question Todd is talking about is not so clear. Okay? But in any case, you can, you can see why Todd says that they all have, they're all a priori. A priori means we don't learn that they're true from experience. So, uh, um, you know, if, if, if gold means whatever is generation, heavy, yellow, and soluble in aquaregia, and now I'm going to tell you that everything that has those characteristics is yellow. Um, you obviously don't have to go out and experience things that are having yellow and similarly going out for to know that this is true. Um, you just have to look on this list and you see it's true. Um, now, I mean, uh, um, of course, if you don't have experience, then you wouldn't be able to represent something as heavy yellow and soluble in aqua regia at all. Right? I mean, those things like yellow is something that we, we only know that there's such a thing as yellowness from experience. Right, so I mean that's why Todd is going to say that this judgment, although it's a priori, is not pure a priori. And basically, the reason it's not pure a priori is that the constants in it are empirical constants, but the judgment itself is a priori, meaning that um, our experience of gold forms no part of the justification of the judgment. Um, you know, on this way of thinking about it, I think in a sense it's even clearer why they're not a priori. To say that a, a judgment is a posteriori means that the way we know the rule applies on that condition is by experience. But if it's analytic, um, we don't need any way of knowing that the rule applies on that condition. The condition itself implies that the rule holds. So there's no rule, there's no role for experience to play there. So on the other hand, synthetic a posteriori judgments Todd takes to be the easy case. Now, I mean, um, um and I, I guess let me stop and say one more thing. So, like, if you thought a priori literally meant that we know it before experience, right? So that, like, it's innate, or we knew it when we were in the realm of forms, or something like that, then this distinction between pure and impure a priori wouldn't make sense, right? Like this, as I said, the only from experience we know that there's such things as yellowness and heaviness and aqua regia and solubility and so forth, right? So if you haven't had any experience, if there were time before experience where you're trying to ask yourself, is all gold yellow? You wouldn't be able to because you wouldn't have these constants. But Kant doesn't think that there's a time before all experience. In fact, right, the very first sentence of the introduction is, um, There can be no doubt that all our knowledge begins with experience. Right? There is no knowledge that literally was before we had experience. Yeah. 
Well, it's um, so it's it's going to turn out, and this is like an important. Uh, this this in a way is the central like trick he uses in the book. It's going to turn out that you that just sense impressions by itself is not enough to have what he calls experience. You also need certain concepts, um, but experience is. Um, the way we get knowledge from having sense of impressions, including internal sense, right? Like whatever, whatever that is, but they are our impressions of ourselves. Um, that's what experience is. Um, right. So experience. The Greek word here is empirea, right? And that's why experience goes with empirical. An empirical concept is a concept uh, is a concept derived from experience. An empirical judgment is an a posteriori judgment. It's a judgment based on it. Okay. Um, so, right, what was I saying? Oh, about synthetic a posteriori judgments. So, um, Um, so as I, as I was trying to say, Kant makes the case of synthetic a posteriori judgments in the easy case, but the truth is that even if I were to ask, before I ask, are, is synthetic a priori or are synthetic a priori judgments possible, if I were to ask, how, are synthetic judgments possible at all? Um, it's not 100% obvious that they are, and in fact, um, uh, rationalism as a position is basically is is based on denying that synthetic judgments are possible, which is why uh, Leibniz denies that all bodies are heavy. <laughs> right, that is, that's why Leibniz disagrees with Newton and says the law of universal gravitation can't possibly be true. What, what is Leibniz thinking when he thinks that? Well. So, I mean, he's thinking basically, um, um, when I make a judgment with a certain subject, what is it that I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about exactly the thing that conforms to that subject's concept. Right, so like, when I think of something as a body, I'm thinking of it exactly insofar as it's an extended subject. So if I say that very thing has some other characteristic, um, I'm not talking about the same thing anymore. Right, like something that in addition to being extended to a substance is also heavy is not what I was thinking. So that's why Descartes and uh, Spinoza and Leibniz, I mean, Spinoza is weird, but, but Descartes and Spinoza and Leibniz all say that things can't have occult properties, right? That is, um, Whatever property something has, you have to be able to see from the definition of the thing why it has it. Otherwise, you're not talking about the thing that you claim to be. Right, so that's how, like, even starting off, the heart proves that bodies are don't really have colors, don't really have weight, don't really have, right, all the things we call secondary qualities. Following lot and oil. Um, that uh, Descartes says they can't have it because the thing that is the focus of my mind when I think of a body is merely something extended. If I tried to claim that it has some other property, then I'm changing the subject. So how are synthetic judgments possible at all? And Kant's explanation is 
um, so um, this is on page B12. And again, that means like um, the, if you look in the margin here, it says B12. That's where page 12 starts in the B edition. Um, though I do not include in the concept of a body in general, the predicate weight, Nonetheless, this concept indicates an object of experience through one of its parts, and I can add to that part other parts of the same experience, as in this way belonging together with the concept. Right, so the way a synthetic a posteriori judgment works, according to Kant, is that I use my concept to pick out something. This is my concept. Right, this is like my mind. Here's my concept. I use it to pick out something. This is the object. It's the object of my thought. I mean, the, Kant always uses the word object in this relative way. Right? I'm, I'm probably going to have to emphasize that over and over, but I'm saying now for the first time. Right? Like nowadays, we use object as a synonym for thing. Right? Like you might say, you know, how many objects are on this table or something like that. Um, but, um, but that's, um, you know, objects literally means like the thing that lies against something. It's always relative to a representation. So you talk about the object of my concept, or you can also talk about the object of my will. That's a different kind of representation. So, um, right, I mean, we still use object that way also, right? We say like, what's the object of this plan or something like that, right? So, so object here is like, the concept is, the object is what the concept is of. <laughs> the concept picks out an object, but Kant says the nature of experience is that it doesn't pick out just the thing that has those characteristics there in the concept, but that thing has like comes with other characteristics in it already, right? So that's why, again, in that quote, he said that this concept indicates an object of experience through one of its parts. The concept represents this thing, its object, through a certain part of it. Now, of course, when we talk about a part, we're not talking about like spatiotemporal parts, right? Like, it's not as if when you represent something as gold, you can take off the part that's yellow and heavy and soluble and aqua regia and leave the rest of it that's fusible and conducts electricity and whatever behind, right? It's not that kind of part. But nevertheless, it's like a part of the experience of that thing. Part of my experience of it is that I experience it as yellow. I experience it as heavy. I, well, I don't, I've never seen Aqua Red yet, except in a YouTube video, but I guess um, collect, anyway, it's like collectively we experience it as soluble in Aqua Red yet. So um, that's like a part of our experience of gold, but it's only part of our experience of that thing that we're calling gold. Another part of it is that it's fusible. That is, that it will melt if you heat it up. Um, right? As opposed to like wood is not fusible, right? You can't melt wood. You get it hot enough, it will burn, but it will never melt. <laughs> right? So, um, so uh, that's like another part of the, the object that's picked out by this very concept. So, like, um, why does Kant think that can happen and the rationalists think it can't happen? Well, like the reason this can happen is because um, when we use the concept, we're using our rule and demanding that the object conform to it. But 
the concept is only a universal rule that can include lots of different things. So it's not by itself enough to pick out an individual thing. How do we represent the individual thing? The individual thing has to affect us. That is, it has to affect our senses. When the individual thing affects our senses, it does it not by our rule, but by its rule. <laughs> There's a rule in the thing about how it affects us. Um, so um, we have to wait to find out what that is. If the thing is rightly represented by this concept, we know what part of it is, right? We know it will affect us as yellow and heavy, et cetera. But we don't know what else there may be. We have to wait to see how it affects us. The rationalists who say that the senses are not a source of knowledge can't say that. Um, right, so this is how Kant thinks synthetic a posteriori knowledge works. The, uh, the extra thing, X, that connects the predicate with the subject is experience. And it's because experience involves this passive faculty of sense, where we have to wait to see how the thing's going to affect us, that um, it, it's possible for it to um, connect disparate predicates this way and to make it to make a synthetic judgment. Okay, are there questions about that? I mean, like I went into a lot of detail about that because um it's easy to skip over that in parts and say and like Kant Kant makes it easy to skip over it and say, well, yeah, of course, synthetic a posteriori judgments are possible. But again, the truth is that's like, that's what empiricists say, not rationalists. <laughs> and so it's important to understand what, like how Kant thinks that works, right? So that means, according to Kant, you know, maybe I should say like, no, yes, no, yes. And, now, I think this makes it clear why this is, which again is the main question of the book, right? How are synthetic a priori judgments possible? Um, why that's going to be a tough question to answer because um, this is precisely the case where we don't have experience to fulfill this work. So, um, and this is the case where the empiricist will say, right, like Hume, without using the terms analytics and, and synthetic, as Kant says, gets very close to saying exactly, to denying exactly what he's asserting, right? To, to saying synthetic a priori judgments are impossible. Um, Kant says if Hume had fully realized what he was saying there, he wouldn't have said it. If he had realized that it means that mathematics is impossible, he wouldn't have said it. I, it's hard to say. In the, I mean, uh, in the treatise, Hume is pretty critical of mathematics, actually. Kant probably didn't read the treatise. It hadn't been translated in German. So uh, he knew something about what Kant said, Hume said in the treatise, but his, his knowledge of Hume was mostly from the, the enquiries, right? So, um, so in the first enquiry, Hume is, he doesn't say as much about it, but what he does say about mathematics seems a lot friendlier to mathematics than what he said in the treatise, right? Not necessarily assuming that all of you know different books that Hume wrote, but that some of you, if you have 100 C, you hopefully know. Um, right, so like the treatise is the longer, more complicated book, but it's also the one he wrote when he was very young. And he said, Hume himself said that he didn't want, he wanted people to disregard it later on. When they can, right, they, he wanted them to get his opinions from his later works. 
but because the treatise is longer and discusses a lot of different things in more detail than he ever talked about later. That's one of the reasons. Um, people ever since have disregarded what Hume said and just gone back to the treatise anyway. <laughs> so in any case, um, so like this is the case where Trump says, you know, they, they really understood the question they wouldn't they wouldn't have been able to be empiricists, basically, is what is, I think is what Kant is saying. But if they remain strictly empiricists, this is exactly what they would have to deny. Right? This they're okay with. This is what Hume calls relations of ideas. Right? And Hume says, yeah, we can know that. But this is the question. And if you're an empiricist, you say, no, we can't have. So Kant has to explain, even though he's given the empiricist explanation of how we can have synthetic judgments at all, he has to explain why nevertheless, in certain cases, we can have synthetic judgments that don't involve experience. Um, So, um, um, I think that I heard it myself there. Okay, yeah, so let me look at it from this point of view. So, like, why think that we have synthetic a priori knowledge at all? Why not just say that we don't? Um, so, uh, Kant addresses that already in the introduction, and he says, well, there's certain cases where we clearly have synthetic a priori judgments. Um, Meaning, again, like this, this is a bit of a running problem in the book. I mean, a judgment can be true or false, or it can be like rational or irrational, right? Um, so, but when you say synthetic a priori judgments are possible, you mean like true, rationally grounded synthetic a priori judgments are possible. Um, so, um, so how do we know that we have that kind of judgment? Well, Kant says, um, you can tell because there's certain characteristics that no a priori judgment will have. No synthetic, well, that is, since there are no analytic a posteriori judgments, these are all the a posteriori judgments. There's certain characteristics that no a posteriori judgment can have. And, um, the characteristics are universality and necessity. And you could say something like absolute universality and necessity. So, um, so if we go back to a judgment like all bodies are heavy, Kant says, um, we can't say, first of all, we can't say that an exception to this rule is absolutely impossible. Um, why? I mean, how do we know that the rule applies at all? Well, like we know because um, whenever we experience something, uh, let's get here again. Here's my concept. Here's the object. Whenever we experience something that conforms to this concept, that is, whenever something affected us in such a way that we were able to bring it under this concept, it also affected us in certain other ways. So, whenever something, like, whenever we sense that something was extended, 
really sense that it's a substance, not directly, but anyway, whenever we sense that something was extended, we also sense that it was happy. Um, but, and, but again, the reason that's possible is because we don't control the way we're affected by this thing. It has its own rule inside it that we don't have. So, um, we're learning about what that rule of the object is by the way it affects us. But we haven't seen all the ways it's going to affect us ever yet. So we don't know for sure what that rule is. We don't know that it doesn't have exceptions. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm putting it in this kind of complicated way because, I mean, this is the way of, of stating the usual problem about induction, right? Like what induction shows is that so far you've never experienced a body that's not heavy. How, how can you be sure that there will never be a body that's not heavy. Um, so, I mean, but what Kant, so Kant says, you can't be sure, right? You can't be sure that the universal law of gravitation is really universal. Um, when you, when you, the, the universality, this all here, he says, is like, a relative universality, and it's kind of arbitrarily extended from what we actually know directly, which is that so far it's always happened. Um, however, Kant doesn't think it's just irrational to do that. Why? Because one of the things that we're going to be able to prove a priori, basically, is that there is some rule in the object by which it's affected. So although we're not sure we've got it right yet, there's something to get right, <laughs> right? But as in the end, once we understood exactly, we never will, right? But once we understood exactly what the rule and the object by which it's affecting us is, then we would have real universality. So the, so the problem with the judgment isn't that it's you know irrational, but just that it's, it's provisional. So we can imagine there being exceptions to it. And for the same reason, whether there's exceptions to it or not, we can't say that it couldn't have been otherwise. Because we don't know what other kind of rules there could have been that produced the same effects in us, right? Like even if there, even if there are no objects like that, um, we don't know what other objects are critical. So a judgment like this never has absolute universality or absolute necessity. It's always like relative. Given what we've seen so far, all bodies are heavy and they can't be any other way. Um, so um, So Kant says, but take five plus seven equals 12. And like, I mean, so here you'd have to, at least in advance of what he's gonna say, try to like establish that the principles of mathematics are synthetic a priori. Um, at this stage where he's just trying to um, like persuade you to go in with him on the question. <laughs> Right, by showing that you really, at least you think that there is synthetic operating knowledge. He says, you know, that this, could there be an exception to this? Could there be like one time when seven plus five was 13? Um, now, I mean, uh, he has to deal with the possibility that someone is gonna say this judgment is analytic. 
um, that somehow by definition, five plus seven equals 12. So, you know, he doesn't really give an argument against that. He just says, <laughs> right, like several times, so that he just says like, you know, however much you look inside your concept of a sum of five and seven, you'll never find 12 there. Um, um, I mean, I think it's possible to say more about why you might think that. Um, uh, well, one thing he does say about it is that you need the intuition. So like, Intuition basically for the time being will say intuition means sensations. So like you need to like look at your hand and one by one add all your fingers to seven and then see that the result is 12. But you know, I mean, you can't literally mean that you have like what about like five thousand plus seven thousand equals twelve thousand. Like you don't do that by one by one imagining five thousand fingers. <laughs> I mean, um, so uh, but I think uh, the point is something like um, you need to know the way objects of experience can appear in a series in order and be added to one another to get this result. Um, and um, um, it's not a contradiction that that, that wouldn't be the order of, of things. We don't know any other possibilities, he says, but we don't, we can't like, um, uh, show that it's a contradiction that this that, that the order that things come in for us um, is is the only order that things could come. In. So um, so therefore it's not a contradiction to say well that is um, we don't know that this is true because the opposite of it is a contradiction. Which is another way of saying we don't know it's true because the condition that something be five and seven together is not to imply that it be twelve. We know it from that plus something else about the way we experience things. Um, it's. I think much easier to understand what he says about this in the geometry place. So I probably should have talked about that first, right? So he says, like, when we say that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, he says that calling a line straight isn't saying anything about how long it is, right? It's not about its quantity, as he puts it. It's about its quality, that it's not wiggly. Um, so, uh, the description of the line is straight, just doesn't say anything about whether it's longer or shorter than other lines. So when I say the, sh the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, then that's just that. In this case, of course, the question is more likely to be that he's going to get some of saying, well, but is, is it a priori? <laughs> Can we imagine an exception to it? So, um, um, I mean, I'll talk more next time already about like why it would seem to Kant that you can't, you can't think of an exception to this. You can't admit that this could have an exception um, or that it could be otherwise. Um, but I mean, you should know in advance that like, so there's an there's a object called the twin quasar. You know what a quasar is? It's like, uh, well, I guess what we now know they are is um, very bright active nuclei of very, very distant galaxies. So they're extremely far away, and but they look like point sources, like stars. 
That's quasar stands for quasi stellar stellar radio sort of something. But anyway, so uh, so there's an object called the twin quasar. The twin quasar is two quasars that are close to each other in the sky. But remember, they're very, very far away, right? So although they're close, we see them as close to each other in the sky, they must be very far apart from each other where they are, way out there, right? Um, so um, astronomers started observing this object and they noticed that, so these, these quasars both vary their brightness as time goes on. They noticed that with a certain delay, this one exactly repeats the variations of this one, right? So like this one will have a peak and then a certain time later, this one will have the same peak. So how is that possible? I mean, you know, it takes hundreds of millions or billions of years from what for light to get from one of these to the other. What mechanism is keeping them in sync? Now, I mean, it's, you know, you could construct two clocks and, you know, move them apart from each other. It's, you know, but nature doesn't tend to do that. Right? Um, so it's hard to explain how that could be happening. So eventually, the explanation that they um, settled on, and now the twin quasar is just the first of many, many objects like this, is that there's really only one quasar. <laughs> and between us and the quasar is a massive cluster of galaxies. And under Einstein's theory of general relativity, a mass distorts space around it. So um, because of this massive cluster of galaxies in between, space is curved in such a way that there are actually two straight paths from us to the same quasar. One of them is a little bit longer than the other, and that's why there's a delay. So there's two different directions you can look in and see the same thing over here. So in other words, if the way we understand the theory of general relativity is correct, and I mean, there are people who want to understand it in a different way, but if the way we usually understand it is correct, the general theory of general relativity says that it's not necessarily true that a straight line is the unique shortest distance between two points. And not only does the theory say that it's possibly not true, but we think it's really not true, <laughs> right? And in fact, this phenomenon, which is called gravitational lensing, is now like used by astronomers to study very distant objects. Right, like it's become part of the instrument. It's so routine that you look for a massive cluster of galaxies that will have like distorted the image of the things far away behind it. And if you if they're in the right position, they'll get magnified, and you can see tiny details and things that would be way otherwise would be way too far away to look at. So, um, so I mean, I'm going to explain why Kant thinks that this obviously has universal absolute universality and necessity, but you have to keep in mind that that's something that Kant is apparently is wrong about. <laughs> um, okay, I feel like I must have skipped something I was going to say because I'm at the end of my notes, but yeah, I think I did say most of this. Um, okay, I guess I'll just ask again if there are any questions. I always make this mistake. Every time you say like, well, uh, if there are no questions, we'll be done. And then are there any questions? And then there's never any questions. I can say that. <laughs> but, um, okay, so, uh, I think that's all I have to say today. We will um, let you go and see you. Oh, I will see you on, no, I will see you on Tuesday at the regular time, but it will be by Zoom only. I'll be in Berkeley. Okay, so I'll see you then, bye.